Uh, so I take it I'm in a safe environment, I take it we're going to have a pretty similar wit because I'm Australian and I do a lot of awkward banter, which doesn't always work where I live right now. So I'm going to take full advantage of that. Uh, what I want you to do is, and also I'm going to assume you're a very pliant and interactive, friendly, fun-loving bunch. So what I just wanted to do is start the night off by getting you to close your eyes. You're safe. I'm not going to touch anyone. <laughs> So close your eyes, just going to ground ourselves a little bit. <laughs> that wasn't even funny. Uh, what I want you to think about is if you've got a pet in your life that you love, I want you to bring that to your mind right now and see your pet. If you've got a loved one, I want you to see your loved one. Someone could be a child or a parent or, I don't know, someone. Think of me if you have to. <laughs> I could whisper my way through this presentation with this microphone, it's amazing. Uh, and then just, just give out some good vibes to the people around you, a little bit of pro-social activity. That's about it. All right, open your eyes, let's do this. I was gonna burn a candle, <laughs> but I wimped out. What I'm not gonna wimp out of is reading you a bad poem. It's sort of a poem. So, I'm talking tonight a little bit about insights and noticing things. And uh, every now and then I'm, I'm good with the meditation and good with the yoga every now and then. And recently I was meditating and uh, I opened my eyes and I, I was burning a candle. Someone suggested I burn a candle and all of a sudden I just started writing. I've always loved writing and a little bit of a drought the past few years. You know, sometimes living in a different country, you lose your voice a little bit and I'm trying to refine mine. So I'm going to read you, I'm going to read you this and I'm not going to read out from it, okay? You should probably close your eyes so I feel less embarrassed. <laughs> All right. So I don't know if you've ever looked at a candle. So I'm staring at this candle. It's bump, bumping around. And this is what I wrote. Uh, I was looking at the flame and I was wondering, like, is the flame so heavy that the, the wick is bending warped? Or has the flame burned so many shadows that the wick is wilting from seeing too much? Or does the flame burn so strong the wick seeks shade too short to find any? Or do they know each other's fate, that the ground holds no future when they reach it? And the melted wax inside the top crest of the candle, is it tears for this ground fate? Is the Pac-Man ghost shadow bouncing around to catch the wick and the flame as they fall? Is the wick leaning back and sunbathing, unafraid to stare into the yellow, hands clasped behind its head, gazing at the peak, unable to reach it? Or is the flame a chiropractor pushing the lower back of the wick and contorting the upper back to help it? Is it trying to heave the wick upright, yearning to heal its muscles and hands and fingers? When the flame reaches taller, it seems to be trying to peel the wick to the sky. So I'm not trying to be profound here. What we're talking about today is practice. And that's, that's, one of the, that's something I try to do is sometimes to write a little non-judgmentally. Now, I thought I'd get this out of the way. At some point, someone's going to ask me what it's like working in America. And uh, much like Andre Perlo, who some of you might know, get a little bit of a, head, a little head nod. We know this guy, a very famous Italian soccer player, football player. He's been playing, uh, he joined NYCFC. It's a pretty recent club, I believe Man City owned them. And someone asked him, like, what's it like playing in the MLS, the Major League Soccer? And he said, well, there's a lot of running and too little play. And so I've been in America for six years, and I was like, that's kind of how I feel about my past six years that happen to be in America. I do feel the business culture there is quite athletic. It's very, it's very on, and it's very transactional, and it's always going. But this quote for me, I find really interesting, because when I talk to planners or creators from around the world, this idea of um, running and being really busy and trying to get to the next content calendar and the report and all this sort of stuff, it's just go, 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 go. And I, don't, I just don't feel there's enough play. So in a bizarre way, what I'm doing right now for me is my play, and that bizarre little poem thing that I wrote, that's play, that's practice, right? Um, the, the thing that stuck with me out of all of that is the idea that maybe a week is sunbathing in the flame. I was like, that's kind of cool, I could do something better than that with that. So this is what I'm talking about tonight, noticing things. Uh, how to build insight muscles. <laughs> Have to throw the word insight there, a little keywords, trying to trigger your brains a little bit, get you anxious, what am I gonna find out? Hope it worked. So tonight is totally basic. Vicky Pollard, Mark Pollard, have not been able to use this image in a presentation before. I told you I am taking advantage of England. This is unashamedly basic. Okay, if you know all this stuff, first of all, high five. 
Second, see if there's something in here that you can just take. There's going to be something in here because there are 50 slides. There's going to be one thing in here that you can take and help someone else with, okay? So like I said, don't judge it. Let's just go with it. Um, manics. All, so we're talking about insights here. So we're going to talk about the basics. We're going to talk about the manics. All I mean by that is like the feeling of insights. You know, I feel like a lot of the times everyone's so busy trying to be grandiose and intellectual and big and long-worded that it's like, no, you've got to feel it. Like, I'm going to see a strategy, I've got to feel an insight. And then the last one is mechanics. I'm going to show you about 11 ways, maybe again you all know this sort of stuff. I'm very intimidated by, intimidated by talking about planning and the home of planning, especially because you've all got like PhDs from Oxford and Cambridge, right? Uh, so we're going to talk about mechanics, just basic techniques, right? And mischief is not a new concept with creativity. Uh, I believe there's a David Trott book called Creative Mischief. But what I feel that we get lost in a lot is like this intellectualism. We forget that we are trying to be deviants. Right? Creativity is abnormal. Creativity, the main, the main threat to creativity in groups of people is fear of being rejected from the group. It's by default abnormal and so are things like insights. So one thing to take out of this other than the fact that I hand drew all my slides, is be mischievous. In the next week, find a way to be mischievous. Okay, so basics. Uh, this is my non-denominational uh, approach to planning these days. There are so many different ways. You can zig, you can zag, you can do purpose, you can do whatever you want to do. Uh, also, I should say that I don't think anything in my presentation is original, but this is how I have fun and how I play my way through my days. So this is, this is what I look at right now, okay? Jargon, I'll give the words some meaning. Um, we do use a lot of these words way too often, and uh, especially if you work with different kinds of agencies with different kinds of people, they use them in different kinds of ways. So, oh, there's a screen up there, which is really, really, really useful. So these are the four things, right? And what I find is when I can get a group or myself across these four things, that the presentations are better, the relationships are better, and hopefully the work's better. So when I look at the word problem, what I'm looking for is like the human problem behind the business problem, typically the first insight. Then we look at the insight. To me, that is an unspoken human truth that sheds new light on the problem. I want to see connectivity between the insight and the problem. So what I'm looking for, like the, the, where, where that stuff sort of falls down often is problem is like lack of awareness or sales are down or uh, lack of relevance or salience or some you know, fancy language like that when maybe guys just find it really awkward to talk about erectile dysfunction, right? That to me is like a really interesting problem to solve. Or maybe, especially in America, women expect beauty to hurt. Now, if you're introducing a beauty product that doesn't feel like it's working in on your face and in your mouth, that's gonna be a problem, right? Advantage, what's unique and motivating in people's minds. So you've probably seen all those pyramids with uh, uh, cost of entry, nice to have unique and motivating. We're gonna go into that tonight. And then strategy, brand strategy, a new way of seeing the business based on all of that. You guys know this, you do it. Okay. Talking about insights, revelations, confessions. I want to have that reaction of, ah, that's so true. I haven't thought about it before. It's pretty simple, plain English. And typically the stuff that I gravitate towards is a little sad. It's like a little beautiful irony in there, right? Um, and that's interesting, actually, working in America because it is an optimistic culture. So talking about things like denial and awkwardness around awkward, awkward conversations around erectile dysfunction, for example, in a culture that's very optimistic, but it's awkward. Because to me, an insight is often vulnerable and painful and simple. So this is one of my favorite quotes from interviewing men about losing hair. And I'm probably going to use this until I die. And hopefully I'm not going to die tonight, so I'm going to use it at least one more time. Uh, Talking to a guy, he, get, he just said, I don't feel accomplished enough to be bald. How beautiful is that? Now he's loading up what he's saying, you know, like, so I don't want to, uh, I'm not too good a researcher to be able to break this down and how legitimate it is, but I could maybe use that as an insight and maybe use it for a long period of time in content, in user experience, in CRM, in services. Such a beautiful, vulnerable thing. The doorknob conversation. Uh, anyone here work on erectile dysfunction? That's the, that's the second theme of the night. It's gonna, you work on erectile dysfunction? Excellent. So you, 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 would, have, you would have heard of this one. So, uh, working on... Uh, sorry, puns. 
Uh, so yeah, working on Viagra maybe eight years ago, what we what we were talking to the client about is this doorknob conversation where a guy, at least in Australia, will go in and see his doctor. He'll talk about a certain issue, hit up, get up, and hit the doorknob, and say, "Can I have Viagra?" Now the problem with that is that. First of all, there was no conversation. And second, Cialis was new and cool and fancy. You could use it all weekend for a dirty weekend, for example. Whereas Viagra was like, wham, bam, thank you, man, was getting a bad reputation, a little bit as being a bit of a party drug, right? So if this other companies come along and uh, people are asking for the, for the product by name because they don't want to talk about it, then that's a problem for Viagra. Dawn on conversation. Uh, I love this one. I'm pretty sure a colleague played with this when we were at Leo Burnett Sydney. We use roadside assistance not when our cars break down, but when we break down. You see certain patterns in the structures of these sentences. And then when I first mentioned, uh, I don't feel accomplished enough to be bold, you know that little giggle that you make? That's what an inside sounds like. It's, it's kind of like, from what I understand, laughter, uh, it, 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 and even smiling are often based a little bit on a fear reaction. And it's the fear of something new or different or not in order with the way that we see the world. And so I, I know that we're working with something that's interesting where someone goes, oh, and a little shiver goes up the spine, butterflies start to get up. <coughs> and so that's when I like, I want to feel an insight. Uh, look, I love Poo Free. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but uh, you know, some campaigns, they put the inside on the show. Girls don't poop. Now, you can get nervous about using the phrase politically correct these days because it's getting used in such a weird, wacky way where I, where I live. Uh, but if you just pause the political correctness of this, you know, there is definitely an insight, especially in certain parts of America, especially in the South, that this is actually true, right? So there's an insight showing up. All right, so feelings. Um, it was kind of funny, I, I don't know, I've been playing, I, I've been a little bit quiet the past few years, but I shared this Thing on, I guess, LinkedIn and Twitter recently, and it's just to get better insights this year, read fiction, read books on writing, write, watch stand up comedy, all great hobbies convenient. And I was kind of surprised that it got so much, well, relative to what I'm used to, that it got so much kind of interaction because it, it seemed kind of obvious. Um, but I thought, okay, well, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, th then I was reading, so we're going to talk about fiction. So this I love this paragraph, and there was part of me that was like, if I do one thing tonight, maybe I should just read this paragraph and then leave. So this is a short story written, called Apollo, written by uh, Chimamanda Adichie. I'm just gonna read it, okay? If you wanna close your eyes, you can close your eyes. Uh, Twice a month, like a dutiful son, I visited my parents in Inugu in a small over-furnished flat that grew dark in the afternoon. Retirement had changed them, shrunk them. They were in their late 80s, both small and mahogany skinned with a tendency to stoop. They seemed to look more and more alike, as though all the years together had made their features <laughs> blend and bleed into one another. They even smelled alike, a menthol scent from the green vial of Vicks vapor rub they passed to each other, carefully rubbing a little in their nostrils and on aching joints. When I arrived, I would find them either sitting out on the veranda, overlooking the road, or sunk into the living room sofa watching Animal Planet. They had a new simple sense of wonder. They marveled at the wildness of wolves, laughed at the cleverness of apes. Are there any phrases in there that kind of just gave you that little butterfly thing? You know, there are at least three in there for me. Uh, do I have to tell you when I'm not asking a rhetorical question? <laughs> yeah. yeah, not a rhetorical question. Did any phrases kind of hit you in that little butterfly way? Volunteers, yes. Yeah, I love that phrase. How good is this paragraph? <coughs> is there another one? Um, I like the, for all the years together, made their features blend and bleed into one another. Beautiful. Features blending and bleeding into one another. Is there one more? I think there's one more. sense of wonder. Yes. So, beautiful, right? Now, that's a literary version of an insight, and shortened, but you feel it, right? You feel it. I only, like, uh, I, had to, I did read English literature at school, okay, I'm not a complete heathen. But I hadn't read George Eliot until America, and America's got so many books and they're so affordable and I love it. This Silas Marner really surprised me, I was like, man, if George Eliot was blogging during peak blogging time, like 2008 to 2014, <laughs> she would have been really famous. 
I mean, she, like every paragraph has one of these little insights. You're like, oh my God, you're so amazing. A man falling into dark waters seeks a momentary footing even on sliding stones. Now, of course, you don't want an insight to be pretentious necessarily, like my poem, but you feel it, right? Philip Larkin, did everyone study this poem? Okay, I'm not gonna read it, it's safe. But I'll tell you the thing that stuck with me, I was like 15 or 16 when I read this. What stuck with me is the, um, that last, the last line, sort of, the poor soul, they whisper at their own distress. So you got ambulances running through the street, and people are like, poor soul, and they're talking about themselves. I was like, God, that's really insightful. It's beautiful. You guys are really familiar with Philip Larkin, aren't you? Is that what's going on? <laughs> I was watching this, uh, this movie, Genius, which is about Thomas Wolfe and his, uh, I think his editor, Max Perkins, who I think edited Ernest Hemingway, and maybe not Ernest Hemingway, who was it? Scott, Scott Fitzgerald. Um, and there was this last line, we are those characters we want to be, we are those characters we are. Notice the comma, we're going to talk about that later, beautiful. Meditation, does anyone do it here? Has anyone wanted to do it here? The most common thing that people who haven't done meditation say is, I can't not think. And then what's awesome about meditation, at least the way I've understood, is it's not about not thinking. I'm going to use like quadruple negatives right now. It's not about not thinking. It's about not judging your thinking. It's about those ideas visiting you. So, non-fiction. Uh, I didn't cite this because I just like saying stuff I believe is true. I believe this is from some research into altruism donations. Apparently, couples who argue about how much to donate tend to donate more because they start to compete with each other. It's kind of interesting. Okay, so we're in the non-fiction part of this. Uh, I wanted to talk about this one because quite often, I'd say 99% of the time, if I'm tweeting or LinkedIn, if I'm putting something on LinkedIn, I'm like, this is so dumb. What surprised me about this is like, so people look to or distrust strategists for answers, but it's better to look to them for questions. So there's, there's nothing new here, right? What surprised me is that no one commented on it, but within like a day or two, three or 4,000 people have looked at it. I'm like, what on earth's going on here? Because like, that's not an original thought. So I'm gonna ask you guys, what's the insight behind this? What is going on in the world of strategy and strategists and planners that is making a lot of people interact with this? feel there's a lot of pressure if you do a, if you use your brain for a job there's a lot of pressure to be right <laughs> and a lot of the education systems in the world teach you to be right and we you would see that I see this I've seen this with like young planners as soon as they get the opportunity to own a brief they want to be right first time and then they walk around like they, it's their baby no one's getting like they said baby but it's also their toys and no one's getting in the way from them because they're right and this is gonna happen as opposed to a little bit of latch and detach a little bit of, bit of zen uh, this is one of my mean. So insights shouldn't be mean and they shouldn't really come from the outside. You want them to be loving and compassionate. I get really annoyed by TVs and gyms. You know, kind of like the way I justify it is like pe those people, they're running by themselves without being alone by themselves. I can be alone by myself. That's a mean kind of insight. All I'm showing here is like capture this stuff. I don't know if you guys capture things you listen to or hear or see, but it's a bit of fun. Uh, this is a conversation I heard on Christmas Eve. I was walking through the Upper West Side of New York. It was such a weird conversation. A couple of younger, younger girls, girl one, why are you making it weird, this conversation? Girl two, silence. They seem to be getting on really well as well. Girl one, like that brother, I mean cousin, you got too close to. Girl two, which one? Girl one, cousin. Girl two, oh yeah. <laughs> I was like, which one for me? <laughs> In New York, is a, a lovely New York quote, it's all men remind me of how far I have to fall. It's a bit mean, a bit mean. So all I'm doing there is, is showing, like, you gotta feel something for it. If you don't feel your own insights, and maybe you guys are doing this all the time anyway, 100% strike rate, you gotta feel it before you put it in, because otherwise it's hard to see. It's hard to see what's gonna come out of it. 
Okay, mechanics. <coughs> um, truly believe this. To me, the best books on strategy are books on writing uh, because they teach you how to notice things that other people don't and express them in compelling ways and hopefully with short words that people don't use very often together. Beautiful stuff. So, uh, On Writing by Stephen King, On Writing Well by William Cisner. Uh, if you're interested in screenwriting, there's Save the Cat, which talks about how to structure movies. There's The Artful Edit. Um, there are lots, but it's definitely worth keeping one by your bed and going over it time and time again. Very common insight structure. Does anyone use this one this week? Something but something else. Uh, the world. Oh, no. Can you tell us what it was? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there, are, there are a few that are basically just different techniques for this stuff. The comma. So we saw that one earlier uh, in the quote about characters in the movie Genius, about how there are characters that we want to be, but sometimes we're just the character we are without the but. So comma is kind of useful, except is useful. Um, you know, this is how a lot of people telegraph insights in, in day-to-day -day conversation. Obviously, sometimes they're just trying to get your attention, and then what follows it might not be very interesting or spectacular. So you've got to be, be nervous. Uh, you've got you to be careful. You've got to pay attention to that kind of stuff. Uh, with poopery, for example, so that's a spray that you put on the toilet um, before you go. It's natural oils. Uh, you know, you say, you know, you know, you know how it's, it's kind of funny, which is thanks for that one. It's kind of funny how uh, we spray the toilet after we use it, not before. It is kind of funny, right? It's weird. It's a beautiful irony. So that's this one as well. And if you're feeling a little stale, just jump on Twitter and look at, you know, what's funny about one or ten of, one in ten of them will actually be funny. Um, but they're just the patterns and you can listen to them. You, you can listen to them when you're interviewing people or doing research. Say like a comedian. So I, I kind of feel that when, when I'm working with someone, I feel like the insight's a little bit too intellectual or long, way too many long words. I'm like, just say it like a comedian. And then people are like, oh my God, I've got to make a joke. Comedians, when they deliver an insight or an observation, they don't make it funny. Like it's, you react to it, right? So say it like a comedian is a challenge to say it in a short, provocative, unheard before way. It's useful when you're working for teams. And then say it in one short word, you know, Viagra, awkward, awkward conversation. Okay, then I can, I can sort of shrink it and then approach it rather than having a long paragraph of a whole bunch of stuff. The thing is, or the rub, you know, pretty common writing technique that you can use. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you actually write, like I'm suggesting that these are good tools to get your brain thinking a little bit differently rather than actually use them because you want to use words in ways that haven't been done before. These are just little mechanics, little techniques. It's like, metaphor is kind of cool. Can any, anyone think of one? It's like, I was so busy just drawing this thing, I don't even know what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, can anyone think of one? Rain on your wedding day. It's like, <laughs> no idea where it came from. Um, it's not this, it's that. So we're not really talking about lateral thinking tonight. Have you, have you guys read much of Edward de Bono? Definitely worth reading Edward de Bono on lateral thinking. I feel like anyone in this industry should read about lateral thinking. Ideas. Like an accountant could explain debit and credit. Everyone in our industry should be able to explain what an idea is and what it isn't and how, how we have them. Uh, it's not this, it's that. It's also another useful technique. People believe X, but why is true? People believe that the earth is flat, but it's actually Round, also a useful group technique. And then you've got them all on the one on the one thing. I nearly finished. Um, so in summary, here's a list: how to build insight muscles, write, read books on, on writing, watch comedy, read fiction, and hit record. To steal the phrase from a friend. Uh, one, there's a couple of other things I want to talk about. One is, might identify as a really interesting phrase that I didn't learn until very, very recently. I imagine most people in this room are what they call mind identified, which is that your identity in life is built through your mental achievement. Okay? I found that really interesting because mind identified people are often so lost in their head that they don't take care of themselves. And I don't think it's something that gets talked easily about in many agencies. We're so, so competitive and we're so, got to think more and think more and think more. Um, 
mind your mind. You know, I, just, I just hope that other than creating mischief, you actually get a little chance to pause every now and then, take care of the people around you, because uh, everyone here is going to have a meconium moment at some point. Again, have not been able to use the word meconium. Does there, does, who knows what meconium is? So there are some things in the world, there are some things in the world that only arrive when you're ready. Like a good teacher. A good teacher only appears in your life when you're ready. Meconium is the first poo that a baby makes. Why don't we talk about it more? It is this amazing, horrifying thing that is dark and, small, uh, and smelly, but it, like it's utterly, drastically human. And because of that, it's beautiful. So may you all find your Meconium moments, not just through the actual literal interaction with Meconium. Um, this post, you, many people would have uh, read this, it's about fetishizing the inside. I don't think that this presentation fetishizes the inside. I believe that all of this stuff is about the two beliefs. One, that insights are useful, obvious to you guys, but two, that there are practical, simple ways to get them, and they should be simple and provocative, you should be able to feel them, and Hopefully those techniques, if you haven't used one, please use one. If you haven't used at least one of them, please use one in the next week and I'd love to hear how it goes. Thank you for having me. <laughs>